So thank you all. My name is Jose Alvarez. I'm the faculty director of the US Asia Law Institute. And uh, uh, in, a, in a minute, I will be introducing our uh, speaker today. But I just want to alert uh, uh, folks that we still have at least one more uh, speaker presentation for this spring term here at NYU. And that is on May 4th. Uh, we will be joined by a professor at Duke Law School, Shatong Sho. Uh, and he'll be talking about neighborhood governance during the Shanghai lockdown, which was actually a front page story of the New York Times. And it's basically the grassroots governance efforts during the COVID shutdowns in China, uh, the emergence of spontaneous cooperation among residents at the neighborhood level, and how that plays out into a nation that, that is still uh, doing lockdowns and how it in some ways facilitates those lockdowns, but also provides services essential to the survival of Shanghai residents during such a time. Um, and uh, Shatong will be joined by Kenny Xu, uh, who is a leader of the food, food supply team in his Shanghai neighborhood. So join us, that will be at 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Wednesday, May 4th. So today is one of the rare events when we actually have a repeat player uh, in, our, uh, in our speaker series. We don't often do that in the same year, but um, he was such a big hit the last go round. And that is, of course, James Bacchus, who is the Distinguished uh, University Professor of Global Affairs and Director of the Center for Global and uh, Economic and Environmental Opportunity at the University of Central Florida. Uh, uh, most of you uh, who follow trade know him as the founding judge, twice elected uh, the head or chairman of the appellate body of the World Trade Organization. He's a former member of the Congress of the United States uh, from Florida. In fact, he was the first Democrat in the history of the South elected to an open congressional seat in a district where Republicans outnumbered Democrats and the first one reelected. Those of you who are following redistricting efforts in Florida will know what a rare achievement uh, that now in retrospect is. Uh, but uh, Professor Bacchus has been uh, doing everything. He's not just an expert in trade. And this book, which I, we're about to talk about, his new book, shows his extreme uh, activity uh, on all sorts of issues, not just trade. He has served as the high-level advisory panel to the Conference of the Parties for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So even though this book talks about the challenges uh, faced by the WTO in the age of COVID, uh, it also deals considerably with the challenges of climate change and how trade issues or trade links, as he calls it, um, relate to that. Of course, this is not his uh, first book. Uh, his other books include Trade and, and Freedom, published in 2004, and The Willing World, Shaping and Sharing a Sustainable Global Prosperity, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018, which was named by the Financial Times as one of the best books of that year. So now we're celebrating his newly launched book, I'm told, <laughs> He just had a launch in Cambridge, UK, uh, and the book is actually available in the UK. The, the, uh, the title is Trade Links, New Rules for a New World, again published by CUP, uh, but uh, he is a victim of global supply chains, and therefore you can actually get the book uh, if you're in the UK, but those of us on this side of the Atlantic will have to wait till uh, the boats actually literally carry the books that have been printed in Cambridge, UK, uh, to our shores on May 19th. But you can order the book, uh, pre-order the book on Amazon. And the blurb for the book, as a little bit hinted at in the discussion, description of today's program, is uh, basically uh, talking about the existential crisis faced by the World uh, Trade Organization. Uh, and why that has happened, especially in the age of COVID. Uh, the book is also a, a rather optimistic look at how we can restore multilateral or international cooperation and actually uh, enable the World Trade Organization's uh, members to revive their trade links 
And the argument is that trade links are actually essential to most of the uh, big ticket global uh, commons problems that we face, including inequality, uh, climate change mitigation and prevention, and uh, pandemic prevention. So the, the way we're going to do this is similar to what we did when the first time uh, Professor Bacchus uh, came to us. He'll present for a short period of time. As he does so, I hope you're encouraged to put your uh, Q&A into the Q&A box. And then when it comes time for our conversation, uh, I have my, lots of questions of my own, but I will also draw from uh, those in the Q&A box. Uh, so with that, um, uh, oh, by the way, the, on the chat box, you'll have the RSVP for the May 4th event that I announced with Sean Tong. Uh, uh, and so you can actually use that link. With that, uh, uh, Professor Bacchus, it's up to you. Thank you uh, so much, Jose, for inviting me back uh, for a repeat performance. Uh, as before, um, my preference is to uh, engage in exchange of views with you and other participants uh, uh, today. So I'll try to be brief and perhaps a bit provocative at the outset. We are dealing now with the consequences of a combination of uh, COVID, climate change, and most recently military conflict. And this is disruption upon disruption, uh, certainly in, in the global economy, but in virtually every dimension uh, of our lives. Um, if we did not realize that the world was linked before, we certainly do now. And if we did not realize the importance of uh, trade and the supply chains that uh, further trade, well, we certainly do now. My, my books sitting in a port uh, in England and waiting to be shipped uh, to uh, the New World is just one example. Uh, but there's some real uh, problems uh, that people are facing now in terms of uh, especially food security, um, but also a vital uh, ingredients and, and parts into production that ordinarily is thought to have nothing whatsoever to do with places uh, such as Russia and Ukraine. Uh, even before the, uh, the COVID pandemic, the uh, World Trade Organization, uh, the rule-based multilateral trading system, we worked more than half a century to put in place and have now worked another quarter century to strengthen um, it was in crisis, uh, an existential crisis. COVID has worsened that crisis uh, by disrupting trade and the global economy and uh, encouraging further retreat from uh, multilateral cooperation. Uh, we could use some of that spontaneous cooperation that Jose was talking about in Shanghai uh, right now. Uh, but um, while we're still fighting COVID and all its continuing reverberations, uh, we now face the um, many, many repercussions of uh, Russia's absolutely unjustified and brutal uh, invasion of Ukraine. We've all learned what Russia and Ukraine produce and provide for the rest of the world. So we're seeing uh, shortages in uh, energy supplies. We're seeing shortages in grain and other food supplies, shortages in things such as vegetable oil. Uh, just the other day, um, Indonesia imposed an export ban on palm oil because of their fear that there would not be enough of it domestically uh, unless they did. And, and this, of course, is 
ultimately a reaction to what's happened in, in Ukraine, uh, which is a major source of sunflower uh, oils. Um, all is connected. And of course, what Indonesia has done is the wrong thing to do. In my book, which has uh, sadly become much more relevant uh, in the weeks since it was published, uh, I try to explore all these links and suggest what we should be doing about this. A friend of mine, uh, just before I started writing this book, said to me, Jim, why don't you write a book about what we, what we should be doing in trade? set aside all the political and other hurdles and tell us what you think we should be doing. So that's what I've tried to do. Um, what I've put in the book is not definitive. Uh, I could have added another couple of hundred pages, uh, but uh, I've tried to be suggestive and specific about a number of reforms that I feel are needed. At the top of the list should be uh, free trade and medical goods, and uh, 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 including pharmaceuticals. Uh, and somehow, in the two years in which we've fought the pandemic, the members of the WTO have not come together to do even one thing about this, uh, despite the fact that some of them have been trying. How, how has that happened? Um, obviously. Two, we have uh, what I call in the book, the trade inheritance. These are the issues left over from the failed Doha round of negotiations, the development round that was supposed to be uh, issues relating to uh, lowering the remaining barriers to trade and uh, agriculture, especially, but also manufacturing and services uh, to help world trade better reflect uh, comparative advantage for everyone through further liberalization. That didn't happen. It has to happen. And, and then there are a whole array of what might be called 21st century commercial issues. Uh, these issues reflect how the economy has changed since the creation of the WTO in 1995. Digital trade, um, competition policy, what we Americans call antitrust policy, uh, investment. Um, digital trade especially uh, is something that uh, we need to address. Uh, how can we have a world trade organization when we have no rules on digital trade globally? Uh, some are trying, but it hasn't happened. But more broadly, uh, I look at the first page of the WTO treaty, uh, uh, which I and others uh, agreed to in 1995. And I see that on that first page in the first paragraph, uh, we members of the WTO, the countries that are members of the WTO, uh, promise to engage in trade and other economic endeavor uh, consistently with the objective of sustainable development. And most of what I write about is how we need to do that and, and uh, get serious about doing that because ultimately we have no choice but to do that. Trade does not occur in isolation. Uh, it is part of a global economy that is uh, uh, contained within the environment contained within climate and uh, uh, the wealth of biodiversity and uh, the rest of our ecosystems that make life possible on this small planet. And uh, we need to begin to think of trade in that way because if we don't deal with those issues, which are urgent, there will be no trade. And um, while I have certainly uh, agreed with those who have uh, imposed economic sanctions uh, against the Russians because of their actions in Ukraine. And, and while I would personally support probably uh, 
even more such sanctions. Um, the, uh, the fact is that uh, this whole episode is distracting the planet from what we need to be doing, most of all, which is dealing urgently with these issues uh, of climate uh, and uh, ecology and uh, the threats uh, to our ability to live as we've long lived on this planet uh, that is changing before our very eyes now. Um, and there, um, these goals can only be achieved, in my view, if the United States and China are both engaged and are both working together in some fashion to try to achieve them. Therefore, the, the further uh, destruction of the bilateral relationship uh, in trade and uh, geopolitically between the United States and China, to me, not only is uh, something that poses all kinds of uh, national security and, and, and other related concerns, but it's also uh, a, a sad uh, um, symbol of our failure to deal with these uh, global issues that truly are the most urgent for our species. Uh, the Chinese, the Americans, and everyone else together that comprise humanity. And it's only if we can come together uh, as one species that we can protect uh, uh, life today and, and the possibility uh, of uh, human flourishing in the future. So there is where I think we need to place our emphasis. And in doing so, as I say in the book, we need to make certain that in reimagining trade rules to make them affirmative agents for uh, addressing climate change and other issues of sustainable development, we need to make certain that uh, our work is more inclusive that uh, we put in place opportunities uh, to provide for uh, more equitable results. Uh, too many people in too many places have been uh, left out, left over, and left behind by uh, economic globalization. The benefits from economic globalization are enormous, uh, vast gains in trade, but in many places, in many instances, those gains from trade have not been shared in an equitable way domestically. And this needs to be an increasing concern for us, especially if we want uh, for uh, countries to be able domestically uh, to find support for acting multilaterally. Jose, I think I'll stop there and give you uh, a chance to ply me with your uh, difficult questions. And I hope uh, leave some time for uh, those who are uh, listening uh, and watching uh, to ask questions of their own. I, uh, I, I don't know that I'll have answers for all these questions, but I, I can provide you with a reply. Great. And so, yes, I do encourage folks to write their questions on the Q&A, but let's start with something that is so recent that your book doesn't address, which is the Ukraine-Russia uh, situation. So just a few weeks ago, uh, uh, actually two weeks ago, uh, Putin said that all these sanctions on Russian, uh, uh, on Russian companies uh, by Western states are illegal under the WTO. And of course, I can't resist the leading expert on the WTO to answer Putin. Um, and maybe you want to draw on the, recent, uh, on the other uh, very important case the WTO uh, decided, which was Ukraine-Russia before this conflict. Uh, but I'll just leave it to you. That is, um, uh, how should we think about the current sanctions and how they play out vis-a-vis -vis the WTO rules? I would say that Vladimir Putin is as knowledgeable on international trade law as he is on um, history. Um, and, and perhaps uh, he distorts it just a bit. I don't think there's any question that the uh, economic sanctions uh, that have been posed uh, 
by a number of WTO members against the Russian Federation uh, to the extent that they affect trade and thus fall within the scope of the WTO treaty uh, are excused by the national uh, security uh, exception in Article 21 of the GATT. Uh, Article 21 provides that uh, countries can uh, take actions during times of international emergency uh, to uh, protect their own essential security interests. Uh, they have a lot of latitude in doing so. Uh, what the uh, Russian uh, Traffic and Transit Panel Report uh, written by the chair of that panel and my former fellow body colleague, uh, George Abbey uh, told us is first of all, um, national security is not self judging for WTO members. Uh, if it were, then Article 21 would not exist. Uh, it does exist. Uh, we did a very good job for about 75 years of not having to clarify what it means. But those days of mutual restraint are over, and now we're confronting a world in which increasingly countries are uh, taking actions that restrict trade and using national security as an excuse. Well, how far are they free to do so? Uh, in, in this particular report, um, uh, George and his colleagues on the panel provided uh, uh, some answers, but some other questions are left unanswered for now. Uh, the United States, for example, had argued that uh, uh, national security uh, exemption was self-judging, that WTO did not even have jurisdiction to uh, address such uh, a case, uh, much less uh, assess whether a country was acting uh, consistently with Article 21. That was rejected by the panel, and I think rightly so. Uh, as I said, uh, the, uh, this particular provision is is in the treaty, and it's been there for 75 years, and, and, and therefore uh, countries have to comply with it if they want to have an exception from what would otherwise be their WTO obligations. Uh, as that panel said, uh, countries have a great deal of latitude in deciding uh, what uh, their essential security interests are. Uh, there's language in the prefatory uh, paragraph to Article 21 about uh, you know, being able to take actions that uh, that country, it, uh, decides uh, are in its own uh, essential security interests. So there's a great deal of latitude there. Uh, but um, the panel, I think, rightly concluded that uh, nevertheless, uh, a country has to uh, be acting uh, in a time of uh, international emergency, and, and that's not self-judging. Uh, the interesting part of um, that report to me is uh, the still open question uh, uh, about what time of emergency might be. Um, the panel there was able to rule that uh, uh, in the particular situation between Ukraine and Russia at that time, there was a conventional kind of international emergency dealing with a military threat uh, with the potential of martial conflict. So it was a very conventional uh, response uh, by uh, a country uh, to um, its essential security interest. But there's a whole uh, lengthy array of other potential uh, kinds of international situations that may or may not be international emergencies of this kind. Uh, they would deal with economic matters. We're seeing now with these sanctions what amounts to economic warfare, uh, which is a sad thing to behold, but nevertheless, in this instance, as a supporter of the Ukrainian people, I think absolutely necessary. Um, but how much of this is justified uh, under Article 
21. Uh, I think Article 21 cannot be limited simply to situations in which there's a shooting war. Um, I, I think it, it needs to uh, apply also to uh, some of the newer kinds of 21st century economic conflicts that have real national security implications. Where should the line be drawn? Um, well, I'm always in, always in favor of the members themselves drawing a line rather than leaving a question mark uh, in uh, some type of a rule that would require line drawing in a judicial ruling. But um, it may be that members aren't going to be able to come together to reach a decision on the reach uh, of the uh, national security exception. It may, it may fall uh, to uh, being resolved case by case as so many other uh, WTO uh, issues are. Uh, I, I'm in the early stages of writing a new paper trying to address this issue that would probably uh, fit well as an extra chapter in the most recent book, Trade Links. Uh, I didn't address any of this in the book, but uh, this is what's happening now that is uh, an obstacle to move for moving forward with any or all of the reforms that I suggest uh, in the book. Uh, that, that must be made in order to uh, modernize the WTO and in modernizing it, save it. So that's actually one of the first uh, que the first question we got in the Q&A, which was actually going to be mine, because one of the themes that came out uh, in, in our last conversation here at USALI, you and I, and also now in the book, is the emphasis you put on the US and China, for instance, separating out issues on which they can cooperate, including trade from national security, human rights, and other more political issues. And uh, one of the questions that, com that comes out of the current crisis is to the extent China seems allied with Russia and the world seems uh, to have to take sides, that seems at odds with your hope for multilateral cooperation. And I wanna be more specific about it because uh, as you know, there's a, a lot of folks are quite uh, alarmed by what they call a game changer, which is the Solomon Island security agreement with China in which um, they apparently have agreed that if Chinese business interests or Chinese nationals are threatened in the Solomon Islands, then uh, China can actually militarily intervene. That suggests a close link between trade investment issues and the very kind of security questions that we have because Solomon Islands was decisive in World War II, it could block sea lanes. And so I guess that's a challenge to the separation thesis that I think pervades your book, which is trade issues can be handled along with climate change issues over here and we can separate out difficult issues on which we can uh, disagree uh, with respect to China. Do you wanna say more about that? That is both Ukraine and now the Solomon Islands uh, issues seems to pose a real problem getting over the Trump and now Biden uh, war with China in effect. I'm a bit puzzled why Xi Jinping has put himself in this position. Uh, and he, he may be questioning his decision himself, but he's not someone who's going to let us know that. And I fear he's uh, doing the exact opposite of what he should be doing. You know, I was taught long ago that when you find yourself in a hole, you should stop digging. Uh, and, and, and Xi Jinping is in a hole with Vladimir Putin and like the rest of us, he, he's uh, subject to uh, the whims of, of one man uh, who's in the process of uh, committing crimes against humanity. 
and the Chinese can't bring themselves to oppose this. Um, that does not bode well for China's soft power in the future or for the latitude it will have in trying to exercise uh, uh, other kinds of power, such as economic power. And like others, I'm worried about the situation in the Solomon Islands. Please see that the uh, president's paying attention to that. Um, and when will the Chinese uh, workers and businesses in the Solomons be at risk? They will be at risk when the Chinese government thinks they are. Um, that's not a, an even-handed agreement. That's a, that's, a, that's a seeding of sovereignty. And um, it has not only economic uh, uh, implications, but uh, security implications uh, uh, of uh, uh, a great magnitude. Uh, these small islands are in a key position as quite a few um, children of American Marines <laughs> from the world or two can tell you. The, um, the goal has to be to separate all these geopolitical issues from commercial issues as much as possible. But we're heading in the opposite direction. Because uh, Putin has nuclear weapons, and only because he has nuclear weapons, uh, uh, we're not uh, able to take direct military action against him. And there's quite a reasonable fear that uh, that could escalate into a nuclear conflict. Uh, and I share that apprehension. So what's the second best way uh, to try to counter uh, Putin? Um, well, apart from arming the Ukrainians, which we need to do, in my view, quite a bit more and, and more quickly, um, there's the economic weapon. Uh, you impose economic sanctions. Historically, economic sanctions haven't worked all that well. Uh, in our own history, we can go back to Thomas Jefferson and his embargoes in 1807 and 1808 that had there been polls then politically would have uh, caused him to plummet in the polls <laughs> shortly before he left office in 1809. Um, it's an open question how well these sanctions are working. Of course, when you say a sanction is working well, that means that people are suffering. Uh, we're imposing economic pain. Uh, and I don't see Putin not having enough to eat uh, or not having electricity. It's the Russian people who are suffering. Um, and, you know, and this is just one reflection of it, the fact that it's really a hard world in which we live. Uh, hard things have to be done sometimes to accomplish good things. Uh, but it's far less than ideal. In the meantime, uh, every day that passes, we get another report from uh, the uh, climate scientists or uh, the uh, scientists who focus on biodiversity or uh, the scientists who focus on the loss of forest lands, uh, the scientists who focus on uh, what we're doing to the uh, oceans of the world, uh, filled with all kinds of uh, urgent warnings that if we don't act together soon to do something about these problems, then we won't be able to resolve them. We'll become victims of them. Uh, and in, in my view, we need to uh, address global governance and, and a much different way, in a way that emerges from much more genuine democratic participation worldwide. Uh, that includes giving a real say to a lot of people who don't have one and have never 
had one. We have uh, uh, 550 million indigenous peoples on the planets so of many different kinds who have all kinds of uh, traditional knowledge from which we could benefit, but very often they don't have a voice in their own country, uh, much less on the global stage. That's just one example. So we should be doing things in entirely different ways, but at this time, we, we can't even come together to do the most simple things. In the WTO, for example, we're about to have, a, a, after a couple of years delay uh, because of the pandemic, uh, we think uh, a ministerial conference in June. It's altogether unclear whether anything at all will be accomplished at that conference. I certainly hope it will be. We've been working for literally 20 years uh, on trying to uh, conclude agreements on uh, eliminating barriers to trade and environmental goods and on disciplining fisheries subsidies at a time when uh, fisheries are depleted dangerously worldwide. And I'm not certain that we can even conclude those agreements uh, within the next month, even after 20 years of trying. And now, de facto, the Russian Federation has been suspended from the WTO. Uh, no one will talk with them. Can't say I blame them. No one will meet with them. No one will bargain or negotiate with them. And in order to get uh, a consensus to uh, achieve anything new, the Russian vote is needed. Uh, they have a veto over doing anything. Is that the way we want to continue to structure the trading system? Are there ways we could go around this with plurilateral agreements uh, as we did with the GATT uh, for many years before we, uh, through incremental improvements, established the WTO? Uh, again, I'm concerned that all of these current events uh, in terms of uh, increasing international martial conflict and the potential for more uh, martial conflict are um, diverting us from what we must do urgently uh, in climate change and other aspects of sustainable development. So you do uh, talk about quite a bit in your book uh, about how trade uh, links, that's the title. So basically the idea here is in order to solve everything from uh, anecdotes to vaccine nationalism, to food and agricultural trade, which you mentioned uh, to uh, climate change, everything has to go through trade. I'm curious though, uh, since this is uh, part of the US Asia Institute, how you see regional agreements in Asia uh, do you see them as competitors to what you hope the WTO can do, or as somehow also contributing uh, to solving the problems? We have RCEP, we have the CPTPP. Um, can those be made into green agreements uh, in any realistic fashion? Or do you think that a way to solve global problems has to involve a global a solution and organization like the WTO? I, I think that uh, global rules and regional and bilateral rules can be, are, and should be complementary. I'll draw an analogy to um, the US experience in governance. Of course, I've been involved uh, at both the state and the federal level uh, during my career. Um, at the federal level, historically, uh, states have often been viewed as what are called laboratories for democracy, where uh, new ideas, new innovations, new ways of doing things can be tried and uh, hopefully uh, proven to work. And then if they're tried locally and proven to work, then they can be tried regionally and 
eventually federally. Uh, ideally, I see bilateral uh, trade arrangements, regional trade and economic arrangements in the same way as proven grounds, as laboratories before um, achieving uh, further benefits of all kinds from trade and uh, especially for uh, figuring out how best to uh, uh, forge and strengthen uh, uh, trade links uh, like between trade and climate change, like between trade and other aspects of the environment, between trade and labor, between trade and biodiversity, trade and uh, deforestation, and so on, all of which I talk about in the book. And, and there are examples of how um, individual chapters in some of these uh, agreements are doing just that. Now, the danger is that that is not what uh, these regional agreements are doing. The, uh, the basic principles of the WTO are principles of non-discrimination in trade and goods. And uh, in its very nature, uh, an agreement to provide on a bilateral or regional basis for a, a better treatment, lower tariffs uh, for uh, uh, the products of the countries that are party to the agreement is also a decision to discriminate against the products uh, of countries that are not part of the agreement. So uh, a lot of, uh, of trade scholars fear the accumulation of uh, too many of these agreements that carve out too many exceptions uh, in terms of uh, tariff and other forms of trade treatment will undermine the basic principle uh, of most favored nation treatment worldwide. I don't think we're there yet. Um, and um, the empirical evidence of trade diversion due to uh, uh, these agreements is, as I understand it, uh, a, a bit hazy. Uh, but in Asia, for example, we, we have the uh, uh, CPTPP, the, you know, the, the former Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, that is now 11 countries, uh, with ironically China trying to become a member uh, with the U.S. having on President Trump's first day in office withdrawn from any effort to be a part of the agreement and with President Biden now, purely for political domestic reasons, uh, refusing to uh, return uh, to the TPP. We have the RCEP that uh, has been negotiated among a number of countries. Uh, uh, in, in the region, uh, including China, that um, is not quite as broad or deep in scope as some of the other agreements, but uh, has some uh, uh, new innovations in it. And now we have what is supposed to be America's substitute for its failure to become a part of the TPP, this um, Indo-Pacific economic framework that the Biden administration is talking about. And, and there, I'm a bit doubtful of, uh, of uh, the real commercial value uh, of, of what they seem to have in mind. There are some good things that could come out of it digital rules on trade that could be uh, uh, implemented and then with experience, perhaps uh, scaled up uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, clean energy provisions that may lead to more technology transfer. And these are these and some of the other things they're talking about are good things, but again, for purely political domestic reasons, the Biden administration is uh, saying that uh, market access will not be a part of this agreement. Um, so American companies are asking, well, if we're not going to get more market access in these 
Indo-Pacific countries from this agreement, what good is it? And uh, in turn, the other countries that are supposed to be a part of it, Japan, Vietnam, uh, India, some others are quite rightly asking, well, what do we get out of this if we don't get any increased access to the US market? Uh, the whole thing seems more political than economic. Um, the, the logical thing for the United States to do would be to simply return to the TPP. But as I say in the book, uh, at this point, even in an age in which uh, uh, American politicians are uh, mostly twisting in all kinds of various contortions uh, to rationalize saying different things at different times, both Democrats and, and Republicans, but I'd say especially Democrats, my own uh, fellow party members, have uh, dug such a deep hole rhetorically in their opposition to the TPP that I, that I don't see how they could get out. And uh, there's where President Biden finds himself politically. Uh, there's no support whatsoever in his party in the Congress for returning to the TPP, which most economists would say is the logical and right thing for the United States to do. Uh, but we're not doing uh, uh, that now. Um, in my view, much of what the Biden administration is doing is simply uh, an extension of Trumpism and trade without the tweets without the bullying, uh, it's, a, it's a form of polite protectionism. And, and it's interesting because uh, uh, you call, and I can't resist pulling up some of the more provocative phrases in this uh, interesting- now, Jose, I would never be provocative. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you, dis you talk about the dark deceits of protectionism at page 275. And I think that you draw a connection between that and the rise of populism and authoritarianism around the world, political forces that are certainly at play, uh, not just uh, in the US, but also in countries in Asia. Can you say a bit more about the connections between those phenomenons, protectionism, authoritarianism, threat to democracy? Well, populism is all about blaming someone else and uh, for whatever problems you have, uh, pointing the finger elsewhere. Uh, and the demagogues uh, who uh, try to uh, become populist uh, leaders uh, do so not by pointing out the things people could do to improve their lives, but by feeding on their resentments, uh, real or perceived. Uh, and this is often done by blaming some foreigner. Um, protectionism and trade is simply one aspect of that. It's one form of that. Uh, you're blaming the former, foreigner by blaming the foreign product. There are a lot of people who have not shared in the gains from trade, and this has been a bipartisan mistake in the United States over the past generation. It needs to be fixed. But they are not in the economic situation they are because of trade. It's, they're largely where they are through a combination of automation, technology changes of all kinds, and um, their lack of the right skill sets to be able to be competitive individually in what has become a truly global economy. And the failure is in those who have, is that those who have served them have not given them the opportunities and the tools they needed to uh, develop those skill sets. Uh, the failure is not in the fact that we've lowered barriers to trade, but in politics, it's much easier 
uh, simply to uh, uh, appeal to the worst in people, uh, uh, appeal to their fears and their resentments, uh, than it is to try to appeal to the best in them, uh, to the better angels of their nature. Uh, that's the harder uh, challenge, but um, you know that's what we're missing in much of our leadership. Now, I'm a supporter of uh, President Biden. Uh, I voted for him. Uh, I uh, want him to succeed. I, I criticize his trade policy because it's not worthy of, uh, uh, of what he's trying to do for the country. Uh, uh, it's, um, it's an easy way out. Uh, it's, it's hard to explain to people why trade is a good thing, but um, here we are in the Democratic Party. We're supposed to care about uh, uh, those who are the least among us, uh, uh, not only in our own country, but elsewhere in the world. And who, who are the victims of protectionism? Well, the, the first victims are, are the poorest among us because it falls upon uh, them more heavily in terms uh, of their cost of living and their lost opportunities. Uh, and, and yet, uh, no one ever says this in politics anymore. And um, I'm disappointed uh, in uh, those of my party uh, who are not saying what needs to be said about trade because many of them know better. Of course, I've given up entirely on the other party. And, and that is a shame too, because what America needs is, is a thriving, healthy, mutually productive and beneficial two-party system. And we do not have that now. So one of the themes that is the strongest, I think in certainly the first part of the book is how COVID has exposed uh, the inequalities not just among nations, but within them. And I think you've now addressed the suspicion or at least the perception that the formula followed uh, for free trade, um, uh, that is uh, David Ricardo's insights is a formula for immiseration. And, and that's very counter to the message that you send. Um, and so I think I want to, to ask you again about you describe trade disputes, putting Russia aside, as class wars, not just trade wars. And I think it links to that notion that one of the things that we've seen in COVID is inequality and the need to solve inequality. How, how would you, as a politician, you're a former politician, how do you sell uh, this perception that this is a war on class when you engage in trade wars, that actually free trade can help with, with resolving uh, Piketty's inequality crisis. Can you say a bit more about why the WTO helps us to be more equitable with both within the US and among nations? Well, the members of the WTO have, have not committed to free trade. The, the phrase free trade does not appear in the WTO treaty. Uh, rather, uh, the WTO is a legal framework in which uh, its members uh, are able, if they choose to do so, to free trade. That's an important distinction. And, and of course, I'm someone who believes that we should indeed we must free trade. I think uh, trade is uh, a, a necessity for um, freedom in open societies uh, and uh, a, a critical key to uh, achieving uh, those goals. Our failure in, in the past 25 years has, has not been in the fact that we've lowered barriers to trade. Our failure has been in the fact that we haven't 
done more to make certain that the gains from trade are more fairly shared. Now, this is ultimately uh, a responsibility of national governments. It's not the responsibility of the WTO. Uh, oh, here you're talking about tax policy, trade adjustment policy. What well, exact, exactly. And do we do we want the WTO to tell us what our top marginal tax rate should be? And I don't think we do. Um, some uh, uh, trade scholars, uh, people who are very thoughtful that I respect, have uh, proposed that uh, any additional trade concessions should be conditioned on the country that receives those new trade benefits having universal health care, having a, 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 an appropriate social safety net, having a, a, a free and affordable education and on and on and on. I, I don't think it's the role of an international commercial organization uh, to require any of that. Um, what the WTO members can do is uh, embrace an agenda in which they try as they best can to create more opportunities for women to participate in trade, minorities to participate in, in trade, indigenous peoples uh, to participate in trade. Some of that's happening, not nearly enough, but ultimately this comes back to domestic decision-making. Uh, part of it is distributive justice. Um, who, uh, uh, who, who gets the gains? Who has to share income uh, through taxation uh, with others in their society? And what is the level of um, a social safety net? Uh, how strong is it? How far does it extend? What are you doing to try most of all to uh, help people be able to succeed in this new world in which we find ourselves. Uh, what we need to do is stop fearing change by embracing it. And um, it, it's a hard thing for people to do, uh, but change is not going to stop what we need to do as best we can is um, is shape this world ourselves or we'll find that we'll be shaped by it in ways we may not like. Um, that's what's happening now. So we need to work for a green economy. Uh, we need to figure out ways in which trade can advance a green economy, such as, for example, at the most basic, eliminating tariffs on environmental goods, and I would say barriers to trade and environmental services as well. That's just one of many e examples. But domestically, we need to make certain that we have uh, the right opportunities for people and that they have the skills they need to see to uh, uh, be able to seize those opportunities. Uh, and you know, the life I've led in public service is one in which I've tried to focus uh, on, on all those issues. So starting with investing uh, in children at a very young age and, and public education that can, can, can really work, provide a grounding for citizenship and understanding uh, as, as well as just trade school, uh, something more than that in terms of uh, learning how to think, learning how to make judgments. And then being open to the rest of the world in a way that will make you uh, 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 think about innovating. One of the things protectionism does is it eliminates competition. So there's less uh, uh, pressure to innovate, to make something new. What, what happens then? Uh, when you don't have any competition, uh, you don't advance uh, and ultimately uh, uh, your market share will shrink, your economic future uh, will evaporate. Uh, protectionism kills economies uh, over time. 
Uh, and there's centuries of examples of that. Uh, and this ought to be part of the trade agenda. I, I, I think that um, in their own way, uh, uh, President Biden and his uh, administration are trying to say something akin to this, but they're making a couple of mistakes. First of all, what they're, they're saying, we can't do any other big trade agreements until we fix these things domestically. What I'm telling them is you can't fix these things domestically unless you're also open to more trade. Um, and also when they talk about a, a worker-centric uh, um, uh, trade policy, that sounds good. And, and a worker-centric trade policy is good. But when I think of a worker-centric trade policy, I'm thinking about a policy that will be open to trade and that will create more opportunities for workers uh, to uh, make more money, to uh, acquire more skills, uh, to have a higher standard of living. But I think what this administration is talking about in many respects is simply applying more trade restrictions, uh, especially in the form of the trade remedies that uh, are, uh, while legal in some instances uh, and rightly uh, legal in those instances, nevertheless often used for protectionist purposes by the United States and some other countries. So I take it that you probably did not like in the State of the Union address the number of references to Buy America provisions. Well, Buy America provisions sound great. Try to go to a town meeting as a member of Congress in your district and explain why you voted against a Buy America provision. I had to do that quite a few times. But, <laughs> uh, uh, there's uh, plenty of empirical evidence, and empirical is not a word I would have used in a town meeting, but the, there's plenty of empirical evidence that uh, that buying American uh, uh, diminishes uh, the domestic economy. Uh, it uh, costs a whole lot more than it creates in terms of economic growth. Uh, it's an open and shut case in terms of economic inquiry. Economists don't even bother to study it anymore. It's, it's, it's so open and shut. Nevertheless, this is something that sounds good and uh, is a form of polite protectionism that doesn't sound quite as triumphalist or minatory as uh, America first. Right. Well, here's a phrase from your book that I, I also think would be a hard sell for some people, including in academe. You write, quote, the freedom to engage in trade must be seen as a human right, close quote. I think I got some of that in the past answer. Um, how serious are you about that? Is that you really think it's a human right in terms of, say, the, the covenants? Uh, just tell me more how you see that. Well, I think it should be. And it, it look, look to the to human nature. We're social animals, right? Um, we've, we've learned that during uh, the pandemic. I mean, all of us have now had an opportunity the first time in a couple of years to go out and actually be with other people. Mm -hmm. And hasn't that felt good? Haven't we, when we've done that, felt like we'd missed something because it's not our nature to sit in the corner all alone. It's our nature uh, to come together in some fashion. That's how we created civilization. The fact that we were able to cooperate uh, together, uh, the evolutionary biologists tell us was a key to our evolutionary success, at least thus far. We'll see if we continue to cooperate in a way that will lead to evolutionary success. And in terms of that cooperation, what's fundamental to it? Exchange, trade. At the most basic level, what, what do we do? Uh, we trade tasks, uh, we, we trade uh, goods in many forms, we trade services in many forms. And what comes from this? Um, well, 
we can make profits from it, of course, but there's much more that comes from the act of human exchange uh, uh, than, than, this, uh, than just a passing profit. Although I'd say making a profit is not a bad thing. Uh, from the human exchange of goods comes also the exchange of ideas. Uh, it, it increases connections between people and, in, and through the flow of trade through the centuries, we've seen the spread of ideas uh, from one part of the world through to others. Um, Buddhism went from India to China. Why? Because it was passed along trade routes. Christianity grew uh, from uh, just one small place in the Middle East uh, to uh, uh, expand throughout the Mediterranean and beyond. How? By going from port to port in trade. If you read the New Testament, uh, and the uh, epistles of the Apostle Paul, he was going from place to place, uh, port to port, uh, and, and spreading that message. These are just a couple of examples. Uh, the uh, humanists in uh, the uh, uh, centuries between the medieval and the modern world who helped create uh, the modern Western thinking that's foundational to all that we're doing, uh, Erasmus and the others. Uh, they communicated in many cases through trade uh, as well as just through their own uh, uh, letter writing to, to each other. I, I think that being able to engage in exchange, being able to freely exchange with other people is uh, essential to human life and thus must be seen as a human right. Uh, and um, I realize there are people who do not agree, but um, I think there's, an, there's a basic economic dimension to life that's necessary, uh, not only for economic reasons, but for uh, uh, reasons that extend beyond uh, the uh, uh, mere uh, mundane uh, acts of commerce. So no, that, that's fascinating. And of course, um, as you undoubtedly know, there's some 20 human rights instruments that protect rights to property of various kinds. Your section in the book on gender equality and the connections to trade also, I think, re should remind people that in CEDAW, uh, there are a number of provisions that are about the economic empowerment of women including to establish their own business, to be able to run their own farms, to actually get the profits uh, from their work, whether it's inside the home or not. I don't know if you want to say a bit more about gender equality since well, you, I, I you think say that's, it a good, that's a good example, Jose, of what we were talking about earlier, how a regional agreement can, um, can be a model or something that, that can be global. Canadians and Europeans serve a lot of credit for what they've done in that ag agreement. I, I've been privileged to have been appointed one of their uh, impartial chairs for dispute settlements, should they ever have any. And uh, I'm grateful for that appointment. Um, I certainly support what they've done uh, in this uh, agreement. And I think it's the kinds of things that can be done in trade agreements. Um, it, it, it's a broader, a specific form of what might generally be called capacity building. Mm -hmm. And in many countries, especially the least developed countries, uh, but also other developing countries, um, it's about capacity as much as anything else. The Africans right now, dozens of countries have put together uh, a free trade agreement that's one of the great accomplishments of the past uh, decade, and they're now trying to put it into place. And they found along the way that uh, one and all, they trade with people outside Africa more than they trade with each other. Why? Because they don't have the capacity to trade with each other. They're missing you know, just the basic roads and bridges. They're missing the uh, 
uh, basic customs facilities. Forget computerized uh, clearances. They're, they're missing toll booths. <laughs> and uh, they don't have the, the people with the training to be able to do this. So, uh, so they, they need more human capital uh, as well. Uh, as as you mentioned, uh, trade has been a great benefit uh, to a lot of women in the developing world, especially. It's been, and we, there are so many women who have a job who wouldn't otherwise have one if not for trade. And they, they have uh, not only a job, but they have independent income they wouldn't have had without trade. And that means independence. There are studies that show that uh, these women in developing worlds who are engaged in trade are um, much more likely to, to stay in school or to get more school, to, uh, uh, to be more literate, uh, to be more uh, numerate. Uh, they, can, uh, they can write and can count better than those who are not, and so they have economic futures they would not otherwise have. This is because of trade. Now, sadly, a lot of this is in jeopardy now uh, because uh, of uh, COVID. And uh, on top of COVID, uh, a lot of the supply chain crises uh, that uh, have uh, multiplied uh, beyond COVID because of uh, the Ukrainian conflict. So um, I have been drawing on occasion from the Q&A box, but I encourage folks um, to uh, put their questions. One of them that, that came out is, uh, do you see any movement on the uh, pellet body uh, paralysis uh, during the Biden administration? Um, obviously, uh, I think part of what your book is about is not just encouraging the WTO to move forward on negotiation uh, of lowering tariffs and other measures, but to help uh, with disputes. Where do you see that going? Well, there's no point in having rules if they can't be upheld. And uh, they need to be upheld by um, uh, independent and impartial jurists. Uh, that's what we've had in the WTO for 25 years. We've had ad hoc panels of independent and impartial jurists who have uh, determined uh, uh, outcomes and trade disputes in the first instance. And, and then we've had the appellate body uh, to uh, help ensure security and predictability uh, in the system as the treaty demands uh, with their judgments on appeal, but now we don't have an appellate body. The appellate body has been emptied of its membership. Uh, I don't address this issue in the current book, in part because I'm so passionate about it. Um, but of course, uh, I, I'm adamantly opposed to all that first uh, President Trump has done to uh, uh, dismantle the appellate body, and also to the policies of the Biden administration, which are only perpetuating. Uh, the absence of the appellate body. I don't think the Biden administration really has any interest in restoring the appellate body. And increasingly, I fear that other members of the WTO who's, who do not agree uh, with the criticisms made by one WTO member of the United States about the appellate body are uh, going uh, uh, to uh, go out of their way to accommodate the United States in any restoration of the appellate body. I fear that uh, at this point, any restored appellate body would not be independent and uh, there will be concerns that it would not be impartial. And let me be candid here. Essentially, the United States of America wants to be the judge and jury in its own cases. Uh, one can quarrel about individual outcomes and disputes uh, uh, in uh, the WTO. There have been hundreds of uh, uh, cases. There have been thousands of rulings on claims. There are tens of thousands of pages of jurisprudence. Uh, 
I, I don't agree with every word that's been written in every page of WTO jurisprudence, including that of the appellate body, on which I served for nearly a decade. Uh, but uh, I feel the same way about the Supreme Court of the United States, and I'm not trying to abolish it. Um, the uh, appellate body should rule in 90 days. The treaty says so. Uh, there should be limits uh, on uh, how long uh, an appellate body member can hold over uh, to uh, finish a, a pending appeal. Um, these are issues that could and should have been dealt with quietly uh, and internally uh, without putting the whole system in crisis. These are not the real concerns of the United States of America. Uh, here are the concerns of the United States of America, and they are bipartisan concerns. The United States wants to apply anti-dumping duties, countervailing duties to subsidies, and safeguard measures exactly as they choose and with as much uh, latitude as they wish. They do not want anyone in Geneva uh, telling them they should not do this or that they should uh, withdraw some of the measures that they've already taken. Why is this so important to both the Democratic and the Republican Party? It is important because of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, one or two other states uh, where we see a lot of uh, trade exposed industries that cannot compete uh, internationally or domestically anymore without trade protection. And uh, being able to apply uh, anti-dumping duties, especially, but other trade remedies willy-nilly with no limit and with no second guessing by judges in Geneva is a way of increasing tariffs uh, without violating WTO obligations. And uh, these states are critical in the outcome of national elections, congressional control, presidential success in trying to reach the White House. That's why this is bipartisan. Uh, so that uh, the Biden administration wants exactly the same thing the Trump administration wanted with trade remedies. They want to be able to do what they want uh, and ignore what happens in Geneva. And their sole true uh, concern about the appellate body is that for the past 20 years and more, the appellate body has consistently upheld trade remedies rules, uh, just as it is supposed to do uh, under the WTO dispute settlement understanding. The appellate body has done its job and the United States does not like it. But the United States is too embarrassed to come out and say it uh, this candidly. Uh, that's why the United States has, in the several years now in which we've gone through this crisis, never once told the other members of the WTO what they want. Because what they want is to undermine the international rule of law in trade, and I fear that they uh, uh, are going to get what they want uh, if the other members of the WTO uh, don't realize that they cannot appease the United States on this issue. The appellate body, when it is restored, uh, must be independent and it must be impartial and it must not be subject to redlining or second guessing uh, by the United States of America or by any other member of the WTO. Because being independent and being impartial means also being independent of all the members of the WTO. When an appellate body member is picked and goes onto the appellate body, uh, that person, when they step across that threshold into the appellate body, must shed their nationality. And what the United States does not like is that that is precisely what appellate body members have always done. And that's why they have opposed a reappointment first of Americans who did not do their bidding in their view, and now others who are not bidding, doing the bidding of the United States. This is uh, a disgrace. It is not worthy of my country. And I'm one American who is going to stand up and say that this is wrong.
pretty passionate there. So it sounds like uh, basically anti-dumping is the wrong solution to what sounds like a real problem. That is, there are some industries in Pennsylvania and Ohio that are suffering, and the solution is not higher tariffs uh, to protect in, in industries that probably shouldn't be there or should be uh, improving themselves, but to help the workers uh, through adjustment programs. Is that is that more or less? What well, you're that, that kind of protectionism uh, does not ultimately lead to the survival of those jobs or those industries. Furthermore, um, that type of protectionism, such as through high tariffs, denies opportunities to other workers in other sectors of the economy. But whatever few jobs we might save temporarily in the steel industry by all the steel protectionism that Trump put in place and that Biden is keeping in place uh, are a handful compared to the jobs uh, that are in jeopardy because in other industries, there is no longer uh, access to the cheaper inputs into the making of their final products. The auto industry is an example. And we have uh, many, many, many thousands of people more employed in these other industries than we do in these uh, 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 smokestack industries that have not modernized in some of these pivotal political states. It is simply a matter of political expediency. There is no economic justification for it whatsoever. So um, that does remind me of one part in your book, page 13, where you echo my old uh, former colleague, Lewis Henkin, when you say that almost all WTO members comply with almost all WTO rules almost all of the time. That's, that's, uh, that's almost exactly what he said about all of international law. But I guess I want to press. I believe I footnoted him, didn't I? <laughs> you may have. But in any case, do you really think that's true of giants like the US and China over time? Um, and so I want you to say more about, for example, countries in Asia where you think that they're almost always complying with WTO rules. Or do you think that was once true, but it's not true now that the WTO is in its crisis mode? Well, it's certainly less true than it was two months ago before all these economic sanctions. Although, as I argued at the outset, uh, these sanctions, even though they raise barriers to trade, I think are uh, largely uh, lawful under WTO rules. No, I, think, I do think it's generally true. Uh, Jose, uh, the vast majority uh, of WTO uh, obligations fall into essentially three categories. The first uh, uh, categories are the um, uh, trade concessions, as they're called, the agreements to lower tariffs and some other barriers to trade that WTO members make uh, as promises to other WTO members. And, and then they're made part of the WTO treaty as part of their, and here I indulge in WTO jargon, schedule of concessions. Mm -hmm. So that, so, so this is basically, I'm not going to charge you uh, anything more than a 10% tariff. So these are basic concessions. And then uh, there are two other basic rules. One of them is, well, in, in uh, my imports of products from other countries, I'm not going to discriminate in favor of the products from one country over the products from another. This is the most favored nation treatment obligation. And then there's a third, which is what we call the national treatment obligation. It says that um, in the way I treat products, I'm not going to discriminate in favor of domestically produced products over like imported products. This is much of what WTO uh, rules are about. And I would say that um, everywhere in the world and among 164 countries, almost all of trade is conducted almost every day, almost entirely consistently with these three basic obligations. 
And then of course there are other specific obligations. Um, it, it's not true that every WTO violation ends in, up in dispute settlement, not by any means. Right. Uh, but um, the, you know, most trade occurs without dispute. And um, what this means is that uh, since there's largely security and predict predictability in the trading system, then the volume of trade is higher than it would otherwise be. This, as the, since the volume of trade is higher, there's more trade, then potentially there are more gains from trade. And then we get to the issue we were discussing earlier about how those gains are, are distributed or shared uh, domestically within individual countries, which is largely a domestic issue in my view. The, um, so I, I, I would say that uh, I agree with what I said in the book. Now, in terms of Asia, uh, you know, even the Chinese, for the most part, comply with WTO obligations uh, at the most basic level. They're not routinely uh, um, not complying with their tariff obligations. Uh, they don't discriminate against foreign products or in favor of domestic producers in most of their sectors of trade. Uh, we focus our attention quite understandably on those sectors in which they do. Uh, and then look at the surrounding countries, Japan, South Korea, um, Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, uh, these countries generally comply with their trade obligations. We can uh, uh, look at the headlines and see what are essentially exceptions. Earlier this week, um, the Indonesians uh, imposed um, an export ban on palm oil. Uh, there's a question as to whether that's lawful uh, under Article 11 uh, of the GATT, or whether the uh, Indonesians might have some defense under Article 11 related to say short supply or some defense under Article 20. I don't know. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, uh, the Indonesians with thousands of products are applying the tariffs that they promised they would apply in their WTO schedule uh, of concessions. And my, my son, who has been a journalist and is trained as a journalist, listens to me saying this. He says, well, dad, that's not news. And since I'm a, a former journalist too, in my increasingly distant youth, I know it's not news. Nevertheless, uh, what's most important is very often not news. No, I, and I often point that out to students that we only hear of the breaches, but very rarely of the compliance, because again, it's it's uh, it's not news. Now we did your book uh, is heavily advertised as dealing uh, about COVID, um, and I guess I should return to that because you have a section dealing with. Um, how the WTO um, and trade generally should be a tool to combat vaccine nationalism. And of course, we now have a report that, that that's not been solved. That is, we have, uh, you know, all these supposed measures whereby we're going to supply vaccines, but it's to the developing world, but it seems that we've fallen far short and we all live with the consequences, which is continued variance, precisely because we don't have sufficiently vaccinated people, including both within states, but also among them. Uh, can you say a bit more about that section of the book? And it may be one of the last questions because we are running close to time, but again, I encourage people to send me Q and A's that I can incorporate in these last few minutes. So what about vaccine nationalism? Well, at the most basic level, we, we have a failure uh, of uh, vision. It is a failure in our seeing. Um, our circle of concern is limited. Uh, uh, and it's limited in different places in different ways. And there are uh, various broadening circles of our concern. We start with ourselves and our families and, and our neighbors, and, and we go beyond that. And maybe 
we include our countrymen. Um, but um, generally, it's hard to see our circle of concern as extending to some person we've never seen and will never know on the far side of the planet. Um, and in very many ways, this must change. And somehow our circle of concern must become global. We, we, we must uh, begin to uh, see ourselves uh, as linked to everyone else in our singular striving species of humanity. We're far from that now. Um, the, uh, the answer I don't think is altruism. I'm all in favor of altruism. It can be a great motivator, uh, but you cannot build uh, uh, an architecture of, of global governance on altruism. I think it has to be built on self-interest. And, and then there comes a question of defining your self-interest. Uh, you know, uh, are, are you willing to define it broadly uh, to include uh, uh, a much broader circle of concern, one that might even reach around the world? Are you uh, willing to uh, uh, define your self-interest uh, in a way that reaches out into the future, uh, into uh, what in the climate world and the sustainable development world we call intergenerational equity? concern for our children and our grandchildren and, uh, and uh, for all of uh, the humanity with which they would share a, a diminished earth if we don't do right and do it right away. Um, this, this all relates, I think, to how we've responded to the pandemic. Um, in terms of self-interest, I would say if we take the right approach, if we look, take the broader and the longer view, we'd understand that so long as someone on the other side of the planet is a subject to this virus, then this virus is going to thrive and it's going to uh, modify and it's going to uh, uh, hop on an airplane and come back here, wherever here may be. But we haven't taken that view. Uh, President Biden, who is a good man, has changed the policy of uh, President Trump. President Trump pretty much didn't care uh, are, are showing expression of caring for anyone outside the United States. Um, President Biden does, but he's been pretty clear. We're going to take care of Americans first. Okay. Well, this is, again, the easy political way to proceed, but it's not the right thing to do. What the president should have been doing is explaining to the American people that those we need to take care of first are those who are at most risk from this disease everywhere. And uh, that that's the way to make certain that we can move the closest sooner to eradicating this disease everywhere. And that's not what has happened. So COVAX has not fulfilled its expectations. And we still have a couple of billion people in the world who really are not vaccinated. And then we have silly nationalistic acts as well, in addition to vaccine nationalism. Uh, we have Xi Jinping in China refusing uh, offers uh, of uh, uh, the use of some of the Western vaccines in China. Uh, so, so he's giving vaccines to the Chinese people that are not as good as the Western vaccines and that won't last as long or, or do as much, uh, how, how can someone who leads a country uh, make such a decision? I don't understand. Um, people's lives are at risk. Uh, vaccine nationalism is a, a pernicious expression of our refusal uh, to see humanity as one. Well, and on that note, uh, we have to end uh, because we have another tradition of trying to end on time. Uh, I apologize for those questions we didn't get to. Uh, but again, this conversation reflects what the book is, quite engaging, quite wide ranging. Um, and I think we've touched on quite a bit of your book.
and I encourage folks to actually look at it. I think we put the link uh, for it in the chat box, and I look forward to welcoming you uh, at some future time. Uh, but thank you so much for doing this and doing this while you're traveling. Thank you so much, Jose, and hello to everyone who's watching from uh, Lancaster in Northern England, uh, a place I love. Uh, thanks so much.